Gary, I so appreciate you taking the time coming on with us today. Your family has gone through quite a, quite a bit recently with the loss of your son, Mac. And before we get into anything else, I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about Mac and who he was. Well, thanks, Billy. Thanks, thanks for having me uh, today. Um, Mac was, uh, uh, he, he celebrated his 33rd birthday on November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday. Um, I'll, 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 t you know, he, uh, was a, a man of faith, great, great faith. He loved his Catholic faith and, and was really uh, amazing in how he really came to it and embraced it. And it was just inspiring to see how it helped sustain him through this cancer battle. He was diagnosed with a very rare cancer, uh, in, 2018. And, uh, it's called Cordoma. It's very, very rare. Maybe 300 people in the U S are diagnosed wow. with it, uh, per year. That's, that's, you know, there's more throughout the world, but in the U S it's an, on average, about 300 people diagnosed with this. Uh, it starts in the spine, either the top of the spine or the base of the spine. He had a sacral, uh, Cordoma tumor wrapped around his spine. It was very hard for him to get comfortable and we didn't know what was going on. We finally scanned and there it was, this big giant tumor down there. So he had surgery in September of 2018 and, and he battled it for five and a half years. He, he was a musician. Um, he, uh, got, I got him his first drum set when he was nine years old. Um, and he picked it up like immediately. I mean, it was clear like, you know, we, we did the right thing by getting, getting him a drum set because he was bound, pounding on things and everything. So we got him a drum set. Uh, my wife just encouraged me to go out and get him one. So I had, had that dropped off. We set it up. He sat down. I just taught him the rock beat and he could play it right away. So it was wow. pretty incredible. That's not everybody can do that. And he, he picked it up very quickly, played all the way through high school. He played in bands. He was in the marching band, uh, and then went to USC music school where he studied, uh, he was in the pop program and he studied, uh, composition and songwriting. He continued to drum. He got out of college, uh, you know, toured around Europe and, you know, with different bands and around the States with different bands. And, uh, and he was, you know, but it really, I think in his heart, eventually, you know, he's, he wanted to compose, you know, he, there's, there's film of him like conducting. And I think he wanted to be a composer. He loved music. So he started writing for films. In fact, if you go to Max and East YouTube, there is a, there's a piece that he wrote called Waltz for Addicts. And it, it was a great piece that inspired one of his friends who's a screenwriter, Leah Woodward, um, to write a little, animated short film script. And they ended up making an animated movie based on the music that Mac wrote. The, the animated movie wow. is right there on his YouTube channel called Luna and Lars. And it's based on this piece of music that he wrote. Uh, so he was really, really into composing. He eventually came to work for the Gary Sinise Foundation. We had him write some music uh, for some of our videos. Um, then he got sick and you know spent several years fighting cancer. He, you know, just sounds incredible. And it's amazing you got him that drum set. You know, it's like God knew he was meant to do that, right? And you guys, you know, saw that, you did it, and it just, the music carried him through. I know he worked on music as well um, before his death. There's an album that he finished up, right? Yeah, this this is extraordinary. It's, a, it's an extraordinary part of the story. This is a very disabling and crippling cancer that he had. So as time went on, uh, you know, he had the initial tumor removed in September of 2018. And they said, well, you're going to have to continue to come back every three months and get scanned. We just want to keep an eye on it. By May of 2019, the cancer came back. We saw on the scan, it, it had come back and it was starting to spread uh, throughout his body. He was back in the hospital again and uh, he started chemo and radiation at that point, but there are, there is no cure for this particular cancer. There's no reliable drug that has been used to fight it. That has been, 
effective. So quite often they're, they're just throwing all kinds of cancer drugs at it to see if, if they find something. So he started all that. Tumors were growing again on his spine. He had to go back in for another surgery in November of 2019. Uh, in early 2020, more tumor on his neck, had to go in for a cervical uh, spine surgery to remove more tumor on his neck uh, in January of 2020. In fact, the last thing he did for the Gary Sinise Foundation, he continued to work through 2019, even though he was dealing with the uh, the treatment and all of that. And the last thing he did, um, he was starting a podcast for the Gary Sinise Foundation. And he started a podcast. He recorded, uh, did a podcast with our videographer who's, you know, recorded me and my band hundreds of times uh, named Kip Perry. He wanted to talk to Kip about all the things he'd seen on the road. And then, and then I was the second one and he, he intended to continue it, but the uh-huh. day, uh, you know, a few days after he recorded me, he had to go in for that cervical, cervical spine surgery that kept him in the hospital for two months. He came out two months later, he's back in the hospital for four months for th- another thoracic spine surgery. These tumors were growing very fast, uncharacteristically uh, fast for chordoma. It's usually a very slow growing tumor, but his was growing quickly. And so he, he had to, he had to resign from the Gary Sinise foundation, just fight cancer. And he, wow. he was just fighting cancer for, for the next several years. And then early 2020, 2023, he said to me, dad, you know, there's some music that I never finished in, that I never finished in college. And I think I'd like to try to, to finish it. And he hadn't been thinking about music much at all, really. But early 2023, he starts talking about that. So he goes to work on this, ends up teaming up with a buddy of his uh, from college who's a composer and arranger who works with him on getting this music together. And by July of 2023, they were in the studio recording this beautiful, beautiful piece called Arctic Circles. I was frankly... I was just a sobbing mess when when I went to the recording studio with him because he hadn't played any of it for me at all. I had never heard it when he, when he, when he wrote it in college, I'd never heard it. He never played what they were working on for me at all. And I'm glad he didn't because I was, I was so unprepared for what I was going to hear. It was all a surprise and it was all a beautiful, beautiful moment to hear, to watch this, magnificent orchestra, some of the top players in Los Angeles playing this piece of music. It's on his YouTube, Arctic Circles at Max and East YouTube, along with another piece they recorded there with him on harmonica called Shenandoah. And that inspired Mac to do a whole album of music. He started talking to his buddy Oliver about doing more recording. So we moved to Nashville uh, end of September uh, 2023. And in November, early November, they were back in the studio here in Nashville, two different studios, two magnificent studios recording more music. That's also on his YouTube channel. And, and he put the album together. If you go to Gary foundation.org, there's a story on the front page and there's all kinds of links contained within that story to his YouTube channel, to Arctic circles, to the podcast, to all these different things. And that was November, early November. And in early January, um, he lost his battle. So two months before he died, they finished his music. And wow. at GarySiniseFoundation.org, we decided to put the album up for pre-sale. Mac thought, you know, if there were any sales, he'd like the money to go to help the troops and veterans. And so we put it on presale at Gary Sinise foundation.org. And it's, I mean, there's well over 2000 pre-orders for, for the record. Wow. In fact, wow. today they're starting to pack them up like right now over at my office uh, to ship out the first, the first batch that were, uh, that were made. Uh, we've, we've had to order more. There've been so many, 
pre-orders. So he fulfilled his dream. He accomplished what he was looking to do, and he was happy at the end of his life. And that's comforting for for our family, for sure. And it's it's beautiful to watch what's happening on his YouTube channel. He's got over 100 and th- 103,000 views since the story came out on my foundation website of Arctic Circles alone. Uh, people wow. are going, discovering that music and going there and watching it. And the video is beautiful because you see Mac, you know, you see him in, in these videos and he's in his wheelchair and he's, he's got a Cordoma tumor on his nose and one on his eyebrow. And, you know, you can see his disability there, but you don't, you don't feel it at all in, in his spirit, how his spirit comes out. And I know his faith played a strong part in helping to sustain him through this battle. Uh, and I was there with him every step of the way, you know, in these hospital stays and, and with him those final days, uh, the night before he died and, and saw him struggling. And, but I knew that he was fulfilled with what he'd accomplished at the end. You know, it's, it's incredible hearing that and the peace that that brought, you know, for you going through this as, as a father, going through this journey with him side by side throughout I know you have a very strong family. I also know you're a man of faith. How did how did you how did you navigate that? How did the faith sustain you? Because it's a whole other position to be in as the father watching this unfold. Yes, well, I mean it was it was it was so it was so helpful to have it and to you know have our family have it and to and and to know that Mac above above all of us was that was sustaining him. And so he was teaching us all the way. I didn't even know it, you know, how much he was teaching us. But yeah. he was, I mean, it just, just sitting in his room now and picking up his Bible. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a, a Catholic bishop named Robert Barron. Are you familiar with Robert Barron? I am. Yes, so I am. Robert, Robert Barron in fact, Robert Barron came to our house. I surprised Mac. I reached out to Bishop Barron and said, Mac is such a big follower of yours. He's been watching all your word on fire videos and everything. Would you, would you stop by? He was up in Santa Barbara and that's where he was, um, you know, where his parish was. And he said, well, I'm on my way from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles uh, day after tomorrow. I could stop by you know, as we lived in Ventura County. And so Mac and I finished that podcast I mes- mentioned that he did. He was going to go into the hospital within a few days of the podcast. And like within a, within minutes of finishing the podcast, there was a knock on the door and surprise, surprise, Bishop Barron walked in and he, he, Mac just lit up and Bishop Barron ended up seeing him in the hospital as well. And was very inspired by by the way Mac was dealing with his disability. He's got a big neck brace on and cervical scars and, you know, really dealing with a lot of stuff. Yet he always had this massive smile on his face and the way he was dealing with it. He, I mean, of course, he he dealt with a lot of nausea with the treatment and, you know, all the, all the side effects, fatigue and all the things that would go with the side effects. But if Mac was feeling good physically... He was not thinking about why has this happened to me or, you know, all of that. He knew that he was one among millions, you know, who deal with this kind of thing. And I, as a father, know the same thing. You know, I, our, you know, I, I, tried to, I tried to emphasize that in the story that I wrote on the Gary Sinise Foundation website, that we are, we are among, you know, our cancer story might have its unique characteristics, but dealing with cancer is not unique. You know, every single person knows, has gone, you know, knows somebody who's going through the cancer. I mean, you just, yeah, it's in every family. It's in every family. You know, we've had it in our family of late. It's, it's, it's one of those universal things that there are very few things that seem to touch everybody. And unfortunately it is one of the things that does seem to touch everyone in some way. And, and, and it seems like more and more as time goes on. I mean, maybe it's, who knows yeah, what, yeah. what we're I breathing mean, you wonder. or what we're eating or what. But, uh, you know, there's more cancer stories than, than we could ever imagine. And ours is, 
is only unique in that it's this rare cancer called chordoma, but it's not unique in the fact that we're fighting and we're dealing with treatments and we're, we, we're you know, it's, it, it's a struggle. And we did that for five and a half years. Uh, I had, my wife had cancer as well. Um, you know, my dad died of a stroke and my mom is 92 years old. So I've got a lot of patients around me and people have asked that Billy, you know, how are you getting through it? And have there been times where I just kind of fell down on the stairs and kind of let the emotion out and just, yes, there have been because, because, you know, at times I didn't know what else to do. I was trying to do everything I could to find solutions for Mac and his cancer. And my wife had some heart problems and, and she was not feeling well. And I just felt caught in between. I I just didn't, I was trying, struggling very hard to, to like, what do I do? I don't know what to do anymore. You know, or I don't know what to do at this moment. I wasn't going to give up by saying, I don't know what to do anymore. No, but you're a human. You're having a human moment and a human reaction to, and you're a guy who has spent your career. I mean, obviously you've done a lot in Hollywood, but your career has been spent helping people, helping veterans. And you've seen a lot of struggle and a lot of, and a lot of suffering that people have gone through. And so, um, you know, I hear you say that. And I think, you know, you're a strong person. Everybody has those moments where they, where they buckle for a moment and they have to collect themselves. Right. I mean, that, that's a normal reaction to what you've gone through and faced. You're right. It, it, it. It's absolutely normal. And I know that all those families, all those broken families that I've had the privilege to touch uh, over the years, uh, are, uh, veterans and first responders and gold star kids and all that, they've all had those moments where they buckle and they, and they fall down. Somebody has to reach out and, and touch you and help, help, help to pick you up. I've tried to do that with some, you know, some of the folks that we serve at the Gary Sinise Foundation. And I've had people do that with me. Uh, no, no question. You know, I've, I've got a lot, a lot of friends who really, you know, they were the only ones who really understood what we were going through. It wasn't a public thing until after I, after Mac died and I decided to post that story February 27th and let people know what our family had gone through and let them know about Mac and how he inspired us through, you know, th- through his disabilities and, and through his cancer fight. Uh, but we kind of struggled privately with that. And we had, had good friends who were always trying to ask us what was going on and help us through it. So that was, that, that was very positive. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I'm used to juggling a lot of things, you know, and balancing a lot of things. And I just sort of powered through and just like did what I had to do. And even though we all knew that Mac was fighting an incurable cancer and Mac knew it, he tried 25 different drugs in four years. Wow. None of them was effective at all in stopping the cancer or shrinking tumors or any of that. So we just had to have been so hard to watch. That had to have been so hard to again and again, you put that hope in, right? Is this going to be the thing that works that, that let down each time, you know, must've been difficult, but again, hearing his faith and how sustained he was in it is incredible, but I can't imagine the feeling every time of it not working. I was always, you know, Billy, I was, you know, after a certain time I got, I always had hope that the next drug we were going to try might show us some signs of, you know, uh, you know, stabilizing the tumor or even shrinking it. But we'd been through it so many times where the drug didn't work that I was always just thinking ahead, you know, what's the next drug we're going to try? so that we always had something to go to. And yeah. doctors, the doctors would say, you know, they never said, we don't know what to do. Um, we're out of ideas. Thankfully, the doctors kept, they said to Mac, Mac, as long as you want to keep trying and keep fighting, we will keep trying to come up with something to try. And Absolutely. so- Thankfully, yeah. we we had that. It gave us hope, even though we were watching the tumors get bigger. You could, you know, they weren't all inside. There was a bunch that you could see visually. And so we would always 
sometimes we would say, well, why should we even go to the scanner? We can see that this drug did not shrink anything out here. Maybe it did something inside, but you know, we just were trying to move on to the next drug. So I was always in the fight and I never had that conversation with Mac, you know, that what if conversation or anything. I never wanted to have that conversation with Mac, but getting back to what he was going through, I, I think he was thinking a lot about, you know, his morality, uh, his, his, his just mortality, the, you know, his, yeah. his, you know, he, that he was a, a mortal being and this cancer was, was beating him. And he was recognizing that. In fact, I've, I've discovered a lot of stuff on his iPhone and iPad that he wrote, even things that he recorded, you know, selfies of him talking to the camera about what he was thinking and what he was feeling. And so I knew he was preparing himself, uh, as much as possible. And my job was just to keep trying to find drugs, keep trying to fight. And I never wanted to give up even in the hospital in those final days. You know, I, I had hope that it was going to be one of those hospital visits where we stabilize and go home. Uh, but it didn't happen that last time. When, when that, when that set in for you, when the reality set in for you that this was, this was going to be it, how did you, how did you process that? How did you, you know, was it prayer? What was sort of going through your heart and your mind in those, in those moments? Oh, that was, this has been, I've said this to some friends, probably Stelio, you know, and some other friends that in all my 69 years, painful times, you know, that we all have, um, you know, different sour, sorrowful moments or painful moments along the way. Never, I have never experienced a sorrow and a pain like, like this in losing our son. And that morning, the night before was, was very rough in that not that Mac was in a lot of agony or, you know, su suffering a lot and, you know, brutal and to watch, it was just, he was, he was beginning to, to let go. The fight was, was going out of him. He had a lot of trouble breathing. We had to put a breathing mask on him. That was, it's called a BiPAP. People use it for sleep apnea and whatever. And it just forces air down into your lungs. He didn't want to take that off at a certain point, it just, because he was having trouble breathing. And that was the night before I was up with him very late. I went to bed for about four hours, got up, talked to the nurse. There was no change. The pulmonary doctor walked in about 6 a.m. And I had, I had been sitting there reading Max. Um, he's got a, a prayer book, St. Augustine prayer, prayer book. That was his special prayer book that he left his mother, he wrote in, he wrote in it, you know, at my passing, give to mom. And uh, a lot of things underlined in there. He underlined very special things uh, in all his books, his Word on Fire Bible, his book, uh, Confessions, it has a ton of great things underlined. But I was sitting there reading that and just praying because I, I, I knew what kind of a day it was going to be. And the pulmonary doctor walked in, sat down next to me. And up until that point, wherever he'd come in, we would be talking about, well, what, what could we try? You know, this time he just sat down and stared at me. And, um, uh, I stared back at him and then I, I just, I just asked him if I should start making calls. So I did. Yeah. And, uh, that was about six, six thirty, And by three 30, uh, about three twenty five, Mac, uh, let go. And, you know, now that we're, we're having this conversation, you know, a couple of months out now, you know, from, from these events, 
how have you guys journeyed through this? You know, I, I imagine there's shock still. There's obviously mourning. What what has it been like for you the last two months? Well, you know, I mean, burying our son and making funeral arrangements and all of that stuff. That was just, I mean, I, I was just, you know, we were kind of, I wasn't going to let it paralyze me, uh, but we had to take, we had to take a breather, you know, for a second, you know, and just yeah, yeah. be together. It's traumatic. As a- so our daughters, uh, I'm blessed with two amazing daughters, um, and Mac, they were all very, very close. And our daughters, uh, they have little children and their husbands are wonderful. They both work for my foundation. They took the kids, uh, for part, part of it, they all stayed at our house with us. And then, um, our, our sons-in-law uh, took the kids home and our daughters stayed and we just spent the time together, just sort of dealing with our, our loss. And within hours, I mean, my, I have a great team who knew, uh, you know, who've been very supportive, great group of, of friends who knew where we were headed in those final days. And so within hours, certain individuals were notified at what had happened. And we started to receive so much love. I mean, by the time I got home from the hospital, after I said goodbye to Mac, I, you know, we had the whole family there when he died. Um, everybody said their goodbyes. I stayed behind. There were things that I had brought there for him, um, you know, that I needed to pack up and I stayed behind myself. Um, I sent everybody home, including, including, I had my daughters take our wife home. Um, I stayed behind and, and packed up and then take your time. I know that, I so appreciate you sharing this because there are a lot of people who are going through this right now who have gone through it and they're struggling, you know, and I think, you know, the fact that you're being so open about it, it's really, it's inspirational, but I know it's difficult. These are not, these are the the most horrific events that happen to us that to then talk about them, you know, it's, it's not easy. And I appreciate you being willing to do that. I truly do. I think, I think, because because Mac was at peace at the end and he he you know he he died feeling satisfied you know yeah uh, with with what he had tried to do and he was happy in the hospital at the end he, um you know I I left him there and shut the door I'll finish that where I was going with that I I shut the door and I went home and by the time I got home there were already two meal orders that had been delivered to the house, uh, multiple recordings on my voice message. You know, my team went to work to notify our key people that needed to know right away what had happened. And within hours, we were receiving so much love and so much support. And um, after I posted the story, I mean, the it's incredible the amount of love that poured out to us after people read that. The media picked it up, so it, it went all over the place. But social media picked it up, and millions of people saw it. And we started to receive this outpouring of support and love and, you know, expressions of grief and sharing their own experiences of losing their own sons or daughters. And, you know, just, we received a lot, a lot of support. That's not why I posted the story, but I felt, you know, we, we started a campaign to raise money at the Cordoma foundation 
And the link to the Team Mac page is contained within that story that's on the Gary Sinise Foundation website. And it, you know, a lot of people from 2021 started, we, we put that up not to publicize it, but because we had friends saying, what can we do to help? How can we help? Sure. We, we put, we said, well, let's support the Cordoma Foundation. They're, they're one of our greatest hopes that maybe something they will discover will be useful to us in our story and help Mac. So we created this fundraising campaign. So there were a lot of donors and a lot of messages there at that campaign. I knew that I had to notify them and tell them what had happened, that Mac had lost his battle, but that we were going to keep that campaign going in Mac's honor. So once I knew, once I you know started writing that, you know, that message to our Cordoma Foundation donors, I, I felt like the Gary Sinise Foundation and people that have supported me and my work with veterans and all of that, they all deserve to know what, what's been going on in our family behind the scenes while I've been out there, you know, uh, you know, doing the mission of the Gary Sinise Foundation. So that's why we put it up there. Plus it's an inspirational story. I, I tried to, 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 I tried to, I tr- tried to really emphasize Max, the inspiration uh, of of his final days and his final months and and what he left us the get great gifts that have helped us through all of that has helped our family manage our own grief and and pain absolutely absolutely and and the inspiration through his music that will continue to you know help people point back towards all of this i mean this really is an incredible story you you fought on and you know the love and i know i've kept you a long time here and I do want to ask you one one more question that that is important because the devotion you had to your son, the devotion you've had to veterans. I mean, I've watched you over the years for years now, as many other people have, and you know, on a related yet somewhat unrelated note, but I think it's important. The Gary Sinise Foundation, what you do, um, and what you've done for so long. What is it that has motivated that? compassion, that love for veterans, that work that you do, because it, it, again, it shines through every part of your life, but I know this is your, really your life's work. What motivates that? Well, you know, I have a lot of veterans in my family and it kind of, yeah, that's, that's where the, the early seeds were planted. But as I've traveled uh, over the years and gone to the hospitals and, you know, I started doing that many, many years ago, decades ago, uh, going to the war zones, all that stuff through the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, seeing broken families, you know, dealing with uh, injuries and, uh, you know, you know, amputations and burns and then gold star families losing their loved ones and watching them persevere through it. And then really seeing what simply showing up to pat somebody on the back and let them know that you appreciate them and you care about them and, and you feel for what they're going through, seeing what that has can do just mov- motivated me to keep, keep doing it. I, I, I felt that there was a way that I could serve and give back to our service members who provide our freedom and defense for us. I've benefited from that freedom. I, I've had a great career. I've been able to do what I want, built a theater and, you know, had a movie and TV career, all these things, been able to do a lot of different things. And it's all because I'm free to do that. I'm free. And freedom comes at a cost and people pay for it. And it's the people that raise their hand and put the uniform on and go overseas and do the difficult, dangerous work. Uh, I value them. I appreciate what they're going through. And I saw that there was a way that I could help them. And when I saw that it was, it, it meant something, uh, I, it just made me want to serve more. And, uh, I played 560 concerts for the troops. It's, I've never made a dime at it. It's all for the mission. Um, you know, all, you know, raising money for multiple nonprofits. I could see what just, you know, getting in the fight and trying to help could do for somebody. And that, that has given me a lot of sense of purpose over the year, you know, that there's a purpose beyond just your self pleasure, you know, yeah, pleasure 
in bringing pleasure to others and helping them through difficult times. And people have done that for me, uh, certainly through this most difficult time for our family. And if I have been able to do that for them and you know, provide a reliable way for our fellow citizens to do that for them by donating to the Gary Sinise Foundation and helping us in our mission, then that's, I'll, you know, I'll feel good when God calls me. Absolutely. And, you know, okay, we're rounding out to, to the end here. I, I so appreciate your time, but, you know, just final question, and I don't ask this very often, and I should ask it more, um, but how can people pray for you and your family right now in this season as you're journeying through, you know, this loss of Mac? Well, you know, certainly, certainly uh, we welcome all, all prayers for our family. But again, we are one story among millions that go through something similar. And then, of course, there are so many uh, men and women in uniform who struggle daily with uh, the you know, the sacrifices they need to make to keep us all safe and free. And I'm always praying for them. And I would encourage people to, you know, pray along with me for them, pray along with me for families like ours that are going through difficult times uh, that have had, had a loss like ours. Um, the, the more prayers, the merrier, <laughs> you know, absolutely. And, and we can help each other through these difficult times. If more of us would reach out and touch each other, we make the world a better place. And, and I, I hope to be able to, to keep doing that. Uh, I, Mac has inspired me to keep doing it. I know he wants me to keep doing it. And so I'll keep doing it in Mac's honor and honor of so many others who have struggled and need a helping hand. And you've done that today. And I appreciate you taking the time coming on with us and sharing. I know it's a difficult um, journey and story to share, but I know you've inspired many by doing so today. Appreciate your time, Gary. I sure appreciate it, Billy. Thank you very much.